Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brookings. It's a pleasure to have you here for a very special event uh, in two ways. Uh, first, because Brookings is very proud to co-host this event uh, with the uh, Miller Center at the uh, University of Virginia. And uh, secondly, because of the topic, which is presidential leadership in the first year. Believe it or not, the first year hasn't begun yet for the uh, Trump administration. Uh, but I think we already have some of the flavor of what uh, life could well be like in uh, the first year. Uh, and there's nothing like a uh, trip down memory lane to uh, try to understand the kinds of challenges that any administration faces in its first year, but that the Trump administration in particular is going to face uh, come January 20th uh, when President Trump is uh, sworn in. Uh, and so we have uh, an uh, action-packed uh, program today uh, that uh, will deal with the various aspects of, of uh, presidential leadership in, in the first year, from domestic to foreign policy uh, to uh, bureaucratic and organizational uh, challenges. Uh, I uh, am very uh, happy to have had the opportunity to uh, partner uh, both with uh, Daryl West and the Governance Studies uh, scholars here at Brookings, uh, and in particular with Bill Antholis uh, and the Miller Center at UVA. And um, Bill is well known to us here at Brookings because for 10 years he was the managing director of this institution before he became the CEO at the Miller Center. I'm going to introduce him now and he's going to introduce uh, the overall program, particularly the Miller Center's work on uh, presidential transitions. Uh, Bill, uh, before he uh, came to Brookings, and thence to the Miller Center, uh, worked at the White House where he was Director of International Economic Affairs uh, of the National Security Council and the National Economic Council. His responsibilities included planning and negotiating for the Group of Eight summits, the G8 summits, and he also served as Deputy Director of the White House Climate Change Task Force bef uh, before going to the State Department where he was on the policy planning staff uh, and the Bureau of Economic Affairs. So uh, Bill is very well equipped uh, in terms of his own experience to uh, lead, this, lead us off uh, this afternoon in terms of presidential first years. So Bill Antholis, welcome. It's wonderful to have you back here at Brookings. Thank you for this cooperation. Thanks, Martin. It is wonderful to be back. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces here in the crowd uh, and in the hallways, too. It's, uh, this is uh, a home away from home. Um, the first year is, is real. It is a real calendar-driven period of time baked into our constitutional system because of uh, an observation Lyndon Johnson made, which is you get one year because after the first year, Congress stops thinking about you as president and starts thinking about their own re-election, which comes one year later. Um, and that drives two things in our political transition. Um, first, it drives a domestic agenda. Uh, if you want to pass things legislatively, you have to work with the Congress, uh, whether that's a president of a different party of the Congress or other outsider presidents from one party who have controlled both houses of Congress have uh, sometimes succeeded, but sometimes struggled. Johnson succeeded famously. Uh, other presidents, such as Jimmy Carter and even Bill Clinton, struggled in their first year. So on the domestic side, it's a real calendar-driving issue. And on the national security side, it's a moment to do significant change in the country's approach to the world, but also because of the relative inexperience of any team working with one another, it's often a moment of crisis where other countries will test the United States. Um, we saw that in 9-11 and in Bill Clinton's first year when Al-Qaeda attacked the Twin Towers. People often forget that 
the truck bomb was in the first year of the Clinton administration, or on policies gone astray, such as the Bay of Pigs, Mogadishu, the shoot down of the spy plane over China, or a failed coup in Panama, which caught the first Bush administration by surprise. But out of those crises often come a team learning well. So just a month after that, we were reminded that the first Bush team adeptly responded to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that all happens in one year. So we at the Miller Center have been looking at presidential history for the last year and a half, uh, preparing for this moment. I want to show you a short video and then get right into uh, the three uh, terrific panels that we've assembled today. An extraordinary democratic moment occurs with the peaceful transfer of executive power in America. Thomas Jefferson, in his first inaugural address, referred to the presidency as a post above his talents. Jefferson humbled himself before the magnitude of the undertaking. It takes one year for a new president to go from here to here. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. History teaches us a president's first year in office is crucial, a time of dangerous peril and exceptional opportunity. In South Mogadishu, the problem for UN forces has been controlling the street. The president was hit. He was wounded. God. I can hear you! <laughs> the real world tests the untested commander-in-chief, and the new president must act. It is also when presidents can enact their enduring policies. The Civil Rights Act of 1964. Whether renewing America's promise at home, or making historic breakthroughs on the world stage. As Inauguration Day 2017 approaches, our responsibility is to look beyond, to prepare for the new president's pivotal first year in office. How will our 45th president staff a cabinet, prioritize an agenda, and act on it? What risks and rewards dwell on the horizon? The Miller Center has launched a nonpartisan effort to research those pressing challenges, and to take those ideas directly to the presidential candidates and their staffs, to opinion leaders, and to the public at large. The First Year Project illuminates the major issue areas, featuring public events, digital components, and vigorous promotion and communication strategies. We are connecting history with policy and impact. President Truman on the line, sir. Well, how are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. How are you? Oh, I'm having hell. What's the trouble? Well, I got a little bit in the Congress, and a little bit with the Indochina, uh, the Vietnamese, and <laughs> a little bit all over the country, and I just thought I'd call you and try to get a little advice and a little inspiration. The Miller Center specializes in studying the institution of the presidency. We apply the lessons of history to contemporary public policy challenges, helping to understand and shape the modern presidency. Our scholars have conducted comprehensive oral histories for every administration since President Carter, creating a living network of the most senior officials who have led our executive branch. The Miller Center brings the lessons of history to life and connects the past to the future. So to dive into this, we've assembled three panels today uh, that combine the terrific expertise 
of our own scholars, but also partners like the Brookings Institution. I think in, in putting together this project, we've had essays written by almost 10 scholars across Brookings, particularly from governance studies, where uh, I had the pleasure of being a senior fellow here. So our great thanks to, to Daryl and his whole team. The first panel actually includes one of uh, my colleagues from there, Elaine Kmark, and it's going to look at first principles of a presidential transition in first year, and we're delighted to have uh, the two people who successfully uh, did the last transition from the Bush administration to the Obama administration, Chris Liu and Josh Bolton, and that'll be moderated by my friend and colleague, Barbara Perry. After that, we'll have a panel on moving a domestic agenda uh, and then organizing for global challenges. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Barbara and her counterparts for the first panel. Well, while my colleagues are being mic'd, um, thank you, Bill, so much. Uh, thank you to Brookings, of course, to Martin. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I was telling Bill this is my first visit to Brookings, although I feel like I've been here because as a political scientist, I am forever tuning in to C-SPAN and watching uh, Brookings panels. So it is such an honor uh, to be moderating a panel today here at Brookings uh, for the Miller Center. Uh, as you can see from the program, we have uh, arrayed uh, an amazing uh, group of uh, scholars and practitioners uh, who have served in four different presidencies. Uh, in the case of Josh Bolton, uh, Bush 41 and Bush 43, uh, Chris Liu, currently uh, Deputy Secretary of Labor in the Obama administration, and Elaine Kmark uh, of the Clinton administration. So we represent four presidencies, and we want to dive right in uh, to the subject uh, of today, and particularly, as Bill announced, and the title of this panel is uh, First Years and First Principles. Uh, so all of you had the uh, amazing experience of being part of a, a presidency in the first year, uh, some of you long uh, after that as well. Uh, but we want to talk then and start off today uh, with that uh, very intriguing question of how does a, a president-elect go from being a campaigner to a short window of opportunity of being president-elect and then start the first year of his presidency? Um, Lane, we'll start with you. Well, um, I can say generally in one word, they do that poorly. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Explain. And, <laughs> Democrat or Republican, this is not a partisan statement. Um, it, and expl I'll explain it with a couple of statistics, okay? Uh, there are f just over 4,000 jobs that the president has to appoint in the federal government. But of those 4,000, only a little over 1,000 are the, the big ones that are confirmed by the Senate. And even that is a big number because it's really about 700 to 800. A lot of those, some, a couple hundred of those are, are part-time appointments to boards and things like that. Now, you are looking at seven to 800 people to run a government and a uniform military of mm, about four million people, okay? It's impossible, okay? And so one of the things that a president has to figure out quickly is what is this thing that he's inherited? Because what happens is that whenever a, a, a big blow up happens, guess who gets blamed? Now, oh, President Obama wasn't in charge of writing code for the healthcare websites, but I promise you, Amer the American people looked at him and said, uh-oh, you screwed up. <laughs> Jimmy Carter didn't fly helicopters into the desert in Tehran but that came back to get him. George Bush wasn't delivering ice to the people in the Superdome in or New Orleans, but that was a big black mark on his presidency. So what happens is that presidents tend to ignore this vast government they run, and then the government blows up on them, and surprise, surprise, they get blamed because the American people thinks that the president is the boss. 
So the first thing the president should do, and they rarely do, is figure out what this thing is and understand that in any given point in time, an organization that consists of several million people, two things are happening, and they're happening simultaneously. Something is going very right. They've got the right intelligence on this problem. They've got the right analysis on this problem. They've got the right expertise. And at the same time, somewhere else, something is going very wrong. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're understaffed, something's about to blow up. I'll just end with an anecdote that I used to open one of the chapters in my book, and it goes back to the fall of 2013. On December 13th, just uh, two days from, or tomorrow, um, 2013, there were two astronauts in space repairing a heating, mis, a misfiring heating and cooling system at the International Space Station. They were floating around in space, in spacesuits, doing something that, you know, for most of us in this room, it was inconceivable, right? And two months earlier, of course, the Obama administration was facing the collapse of the, the meltdown in its healthcare websites. Well, in October of 2013, and November and December, everybody started writing, oh my God, the government, what a mess. It can't do anything, it can't do technology, blah, 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 blah. Of course, the same government, in the same fashion, had these two guys up in space wandering <laughs> around with wrenches or whatever they were doing. Um, the fact of the matter is that at CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and at NASA, federal bureaucrats, had contracted with private sector companies to do a job the government wanted done. At NASA, there's a company in Western Massachusetts, they make spacesuits, okay? <laughs> Go figure, they make the spacesuits that these guys were wearing. So, in other words, the process wasn't any different. It's just that at any given time, something's going right and something's going wrong. Presidents generally figure this out when it's too late. <laughs> and then they discover that their campaign skills of messaging, tweeting, speech making, rallies, your campaign skills don't help you when the government has blown up in your face. Which is why it behooves presidents to spend a little less time wandering around the country and a little bit more time in their first year figuring out what is happening in the government that they are the head of. You know, Elaine's uh, example of things blowing up does make me think of a first year fiasco, as it was called, the Bay of Pigs invasion, the debacle, the fiasco of the Bay of Pigs. And certainly that blew up in, in President Kennedy's face. And he went on national television and said, I take responsibility for this. I am the responsible officer of this government. And his opinion poll rating soared to 83%. So there might be a little bit of a lesson. And if the people are going to blame you anyway, go ahead and take responsibility. <laughs> and it might work in your, in your favor. Um, let me go to Josh. We'll go in chronological order, according to presidents, and, and particularly mm -hmm. President Bush 43. Um, a little bit about the fact that you were with him throughout the campaign as a, the head of policy, and then part of the transition uh, but in a very short window of opportunity because of the Bush v. Gore controversy. <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> uh, and, th and thank you for doing the, this program and the work you do, both at Brookings and the Miller Center. It's, it's an important public service. Um, yeah, I had, the, I had the good fortune of being a part of the Bush campaign the Bush 2000 presidential campaign, which began at the beginning of 1999, so almost two full years before the election, I arrived in Austin, Texas, as the policy director of the Bush 2000 campaign. Chris, I know you, you started pretty early in the Obama campaign, um, and that's, that's the first way that you, uh, that you start uh, to build the pr a presidency that can withstand the, the difficult period of transition that every president faces. 
President Bush, then Governor Bush, said something very interesting to me on my first day when I arrived in Austin. Uh, and I, I met him in his, uh, his gubernatorial office. And uh, he said, I, uh, yeah, go out and do a smart thing, you know, put all the policy together. Um, and he said, but just remember one thing. I want to campaign the way I'm going to govern. I'm going to govern the way I campaigned. And every presidential candidate ought to, ought to begin a campaign that way. I, I, don't, I doubt whether he used the same kind of words, but I bet President Obama said much the same thing. And what he was telling me and uh, the rest of the staff was uh, build a campaign, build a policy uh, structure that is something that I can take in to the White House and implement because what I say on the road is what I'm going to do when I'm in the Oval Office. Um, we were blessed in the Bush campaign also with having a campaign staff that was essentially uh, a staff that was itself ready to move into governance. Um, I was the policy director. I became the deputy chief of staff for policy. Carl Rove was the chief political strategist. He became the strategist in the White House. Karen Hughes was the head communicator. She became the head of communications in the White House. And when, and when, you have, when you've built a good campaign team that's ready to move into the White House, you're able to, uh, uh, to mitigate the, uh, another source of great disruption during transitions, which is the, just the total changeover in, in personnel. Very often, campaign people uh, are not good governance people and vice versa. And, uh, and in building a campaign and in building a government, I think, I think presidents ought to look for both. So we, uh, we were unusually blessed. We, we had only half of the usual transition because of the, um, because of the recount in Florida. Uh, and yet I think we came in with only 37 days worth of transition in, in much better condition to, uh, to know who was going to be in government along with President Bush uh, and what the agenda was. We had a 450-page policy book that, that spelled it out. Um, my concern for the, the, uh, the current transition is that they're not in that sort of position. There, there is not a thick policy agenda with, with detail to it. There, there are certainly inclinations and directions and so on, which, which is what the public pays attention to and worked very well for President-elect Trump. And there's also not the big infrastructure of people ready, ready to move in with him. So it's incumbent on all of us, including through processes like these, uh, to, to help uh, what is a difficult situation for the best prepared um, for those that, um, those that are coming behind us. Well, that's a perfect link then to uh, Chris Liu and the fact that the outgoing Bush 43 administration worked very closely, as I understand, uh, Chris, with the transition team for President Obama to make that transition as smooth as possible. You know, in every setting, like this, I always compliment Josh for the tone that he and President Bush set really in that, early. That's why I show up at these events. <laughs> in, in, 2007, in 2007, for pledging full collaboration and cooperation with the incoming uh, president, regardless of which party it was. And the success that we enjoyed in 2008 in our transition really is in large measure because of the cooperation that we received. Uh, I was in daily communications with Josh's deputy, Blake Gottesman, uh, working through transition issues all 77 days. And so in return, President Obama has pledged that same level of collaboration uh, with his successor. And, and, and I think on balance, we are doing that. It is certainly challenging, though. I mean, I think it's fair to say there is a playbook of how you transition from campaigning to governing. Uh, this is a president-elect who not only is turning that playbook on its head, but it's ripping it up. And you know whether it's with foreign policy statements, with tweets, with um, the carrier deal, there's, there's a lot of things here um, that we have not seen before. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether on noon of January 20th that changes or not. I suspect it will not. And so this is, this is going to be an interesting ride for all of us. 
to be sure. Uh, let's then turn to uh, governing itself. Uh, we, let's say we've gotten through the transition. Uh, you have situations, as in the case of, of President Bush 43, where uh, he had a very clear agenda in the campaign. Um, and so to say I want to govern the way I campaigned uh, makes for it, would seem to me, a fairly smooth transition to prioritization uh, of policy topics and policy issues. Elaine, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, President Clinton and uh, his prioritization and what he brought in as a priority and what might have begun to be imposed upon him by events. Well, his, um, it, I mean, he had a similar saying, Josh, as to his, his saying was, um, the good government is good politics, that that's, you know, if you can get it all going right. And therefore, I think the most important thing he did was the very first budget in the first year, which he got a lot of grief for, okay? A lot of grief. It cost us some congressional seats, et cetera. But it was absolutely critical in setting us on the road to what was, by the seventh year, a balanced budget, first and only time we've had a balanced budget in many, many, many decades. So there was, a, there was a clear direction. He understood that that was the most important thing he had to do. And like Reagan before him, Reagan is the only other president I know who got this right, they understood that macroeconomic policy is a very blunt instrument and it takes a long time. So you have to do the, the tough, ugly stuff you have to do in your first year. Mm -hmm. And so Clinton did that um, with that first budget deal and that first reconciliation deal. So did Reagan with his first budget deal. And you know, by 1984, it was morning in America. And I remember this well, because I was working for Walter Mondale, and that was pretty, uh, pretty depressing campaign to work in. <laughs> um, and by 1996, I mean, uh, we had incredibly low unemployment and peace in the world and you know, all sorts of things that incumbent presidents want to have. So doing the, those tough things early is really the most important thing. And then, of course, getting used to running a government. Um, in my book, I talk about a scene I witnessed between Al Gore and Bill Clinton. And it was one of those awkward things where there were a lot of people in the Oval Office, and then they all went off into Betty Curry's office on the side there, and it, there was sort of a traffic jam. So I was the last one, and I couldn't get out. You know, I was like <laughs> stuck. And you know, and you're, I was, you know, obviously Al Gore wanted to say something to Bill Clinton, and I, so I sort of stood there stupidly trying to pretend I wasn't there. <laughs> um, and I got to watch Al Gore say to Clinton. You must say this, 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 and this. And, and it was on a foreign policy question. And what was going on was Gore, who was more familiar with foreign policy, was saying to Clinton, who was, you know, maybe the best ad lib speech maker in American <laughs> history, um, this is one place you, you, you don't ad lib. All right, because foreign policy statements have consequences. The world looks at them and parses them. Usually the diplomats work them out. And so precision of language matters, as opposed to when Bill Clinton was talking about Medicaid or welfare or something like this. So um, there's a lot of learning. And sometimes it's very counterintuitive. Uh, you, I don't know who's going to tell that to President-elect Trump. Okay, somebody's going to need to say to him, I don't know when he's going to learn that precision in language matters, that when you're the president, there are consequences to what you say, and that this freewheeling, you know, um, campaign that he's run, which had many, def definitely many electoral advantages, um, is going to be a problem in governing. So, so they all go through this to a certain extent, I, but they all have sort of some inkling of something. Um, this current transition is unusual, and to, to say the least. Uh, Chris, um, could you tell us about uh, transitioning into policy making, um, the links to the campaign agenda, which had uh, health care reform at the top for <laughs> President Obama, uh, but coming into office with uh, an ongoing crisis and an economic uh, meltdown in the financial world? 
You know, when we started transition planning in uh, April of 2008, uh, we were focusing on immigration, education, health care, the whole range of issues. You know, by the time we took office on January 20th of 2009, there was only one issue, and that was the economy. <laughs> right. You know, I recall that very first jobs number that we got uh, in February of 2009. The country had lost 800,000 jobs, more than the number of people in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so no matter what else you had campaigned on, the number one uh, governing principle had to be get, getting the economy back up and running. So you'll recall three weeks after election, uh, after inauguration day, Congress passed an $800 billion stimulus package. Uh, and then the charge from Vice President Biden, who oversaw the uh, Recovery Act, was to get the money out the door as fast as possible with as little waste, fraud, and abuse as possible. And at that time, you'll recall, I mean, we had you know a couple cabinet members confirmed, not many people around them. And so the ability to get $800 billion out the door was really in large measure because of the career leadership at these departments who understood that these are the programs you can put money into that would have the greatest impact as quickly as possible. And so you know, there is often a um, a criticism of career employees and their ability to move quickly and to drive your change. We learned very early on in that first six months, you can't accomplish anything unless you have the career leadership uh, behind you. And that brings me then, then to Josh and, and uh, President George W. Bush. Uh, again, very clear agenda coming into office. Um, talk about that. Talk about how he implemented that agenda. And to both Chris and Elaine's points about being able to reach out to leadership, both in the executive agencies and in Congress, and others in Congress. Um, the President Bush came into office having, having published two books of policy in his campaign, one of them which we published in either July or August of 2008, I mentioned was 450 pages long. It was, uh, it was uh, detailed policy speeches, and then five or six page fact sheets with all the details that, that went behind the speeches so that you, you could tell the policy direction and philosophy and principle from the speech. You got the numbers, you got the, you got the programmatic details in the fact sheets. So uh, when we came into the White House in January of 2001, we didn't, we didn't have to have a lot of meetings about what are the policies that, um, uh, that the, the president wants to implement immediately. We, uh, we didn't face uh, a crisis on the way in the door as, as Chris and his gang did, but we did face an economy that was headed into recession. Um, we, had, uh, we had policies that were well designed to combat that recession, in, in particular a large tax cut, uh, which President Bush had campaigned on being necessary regardless, but uh, had also, uh, he had, had had advice from his economic advisors to the effect that a recession was likely on the way and that this would be the best antidote. So uh, we, we weren't confused about what the policy priorities were Education was a big one. President Bush, by the way, no one will remember this, President Bush campaigned on being the education president. That was his intent when he came in and, in fact, campaigned against Al Gore on the notion that the Clinton administration had become too distracted by foreign activities and nation building and that the, the Bush administration wasn't going to participate in, in that sort of activity. Um, and I'm, I'm probably anticipating a, a, amazing. A, 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 <laughs> probably anticipating a further question about how events change. <laughs> uh, the perspective of every president, they always do. Um, but on the way in, that, that gave us a, an opportunity to focus. President Bush did, did one other thing um, that I, I, uh, I think was, was generally regarded as having been a shortcoming of the Clinton administration on the way in the door, and uh, maybe a shortcoming of the Trump administration on the way in the door, and that is focus on the White House. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a tendency in every transition to focus on the big shiny objects, which are the big cabinet posts, and those are absolutely critically important, um, but it causes um, presidents-elect to, and their senior teams to neglect the construction of the White House staff, 
which actually is the group that's going to help drive the really critical presidential priorities. The, the, government is, the government that Elaine described so well in her first set of remarks is pretty darn resilient. <laughs> and, right. and some would say impervious. <laughs> um, but it's, it, is, it, is very, uh, it is very capable of running itself uh, at least sort of a, on a steady state without, politi without substantial political leadership. It is only on those issues where the president really wants to take the country in a particular direction, especially a new direction, where the presidential leadership counts a lot. And typically that, can, that comes from the White House. So they don't, they don't have to be you know, big, big public figures, but the folks who, whom the president brings in the White House and empowers to drive those initiatives um, are the are key appointments early on in a presidency, um, and I think uh, especially those who are less familiar with governance have a tendency to to neglect that aspect of of the early part of a transition. One of my favorite stories in um, doing the oral history for Bush 43 at the Miller Center, we've done every president's oral history from Jimmy Carter, really starting with uh, the administration of Gerald Ford and carrying on through, and we're coming to the uh, end of the Bush 43 project, and those are still confidential, but this is in the public record. Again, one of my favorite stories from that administration is, uh, and this might be a lesson for President-elect Trump, given that he is a media impresario, and that is that President uh, Bush 43 invited Ted Kennedy and his family within the first few weeks of the administration down to the White House Theater to watch the then new film, 13 Days, about the Cuban Missile Crisis. So here sat Ted Kennedy with uh, President George W. Bush watching a film about Ted Kennedy's brother a few yards away in the Oval Office and the cabinet room coming to terms with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the Bush Library, where I just had the, the pleasure of uh, visiting for the first time last week with, with Bill, um, I noted that they had a handwritten thank you note from Ted Kennedy to President Bush thanking him for bringing him and his family down to the White House to see 13 Days. And he said, um, I hope that I'll have many opportunities to come down to the, to the White House and to the Rose Garden and watch you sign some uh, policies that we can agree on. And he said, including education and health care. Uh, and apart from that, that outreach uh, and that bringing together of two people from across the aisle, uh, which Ted Kennedy had done on many occasions and, and Governor Bush had done uh, in Texas, uh, from that grew the, the No Child Left Behind policy. Now, there can be issues about whether that was the best policy for education, but the point is one of reaching out to the other side and the other side accepting that outreach and carrying on from there. Yes, but, well, Barbara, the, yes. I mean, President Bush is, uh, in, at, after the tax cuts, the top priority or the top both temporal and uh, principal priority was the No Child Left Behind Act for which President Bush's partners were Democrat George Miller in the House, the House. and Democrat Ted Kennedy in the Senate. And um, many people will recall that when 9-11 happened, Laura Bush was on the Hill. She was with Ted Kennedy, preparing to do a hearing on the No Child mm -hmm. Left Behind Act. And eventually, the act did get uh, adopted, and Ted Kennedy was there in the Rose Garden, but the country went off on a different direction. That's right. And in addition, that the at the wonderful display with the Ted Kennedy handwritten note to President Bush is also a painting. Ted Kennedy was an amateur artist, and he painted daffodils, and he gave that painting to the First Lady Laura Bush with a, a very nice inscription. So again, it does show that. Uh, come let us reason together. We can work across the aisle. Well, that takes us, of course, to uh, the, the notion that crises, domestic and, and foreign and, and defense crises, military crises, can intervene and disrupt the very best laid plans of, of an incoming president. Um, Josh, since you mentioned 9-11, let us start there and, and talk about the impact that 9-11 had on, on President Bush's first year in office. Oh, um, total. I mean, it, it, it can't be overstated what a, what a radical change in the agenda of the Bush administration, of government, the federal government, and I think of the whole country, 
was the, was the product of the 9-11 attack. And the, the whole focus of the administration changed overnight. Um, interestingly, I think President Bush was, was among the first to, to recognize how profound and complete the change would be when he, he convened basically his war cabinet on the evening of September 11th. And he started giving different instructions, including to the FBI director, saying your, your mission just changed. Your mission traditionally has been to catch the bad guys after they do the deed. It needs to change. It's now we have to catch them before they Definitely. do the bad deeds. So and that, that story was written uh, across at least half the government and changed the focus, the tenor uh, of the entire government in, in ways, as I just suggested, that were completely unexpected in the campaign that President Bush ran. Elaine, thoughts about uh, President Clinton and things like the Waco disaster, for example. Yeah, I mean, again, the the Waco was Waco was probably. I mean, it wasn't. Clinton didn't have anything nearly like President Obama or President Bush did. I mean, there was no financial crisis. There was no major um, attack on the United States. Mm -hmm. So he had a much more normal, shall we say, <laughs> first year. But there were those. Everything from gays in the military to Waco was evidence of my you know, opening remarks, which is that he really wasn't very familiar with the government he was running, right? So, so an outsider, and yeah, he'd, he'd been a governor, but yeah, not I mean, there were certain of pieces of it he knew quite well, okay? I mean, you know, he could go toe to, God forbid you made a mistake briefing him about Medicare, because he knew <laughs> everything, right? But there were other, I mean, no president comes in knowing the whole shebang, okay? And so, he clearly, there were just mistakes he made in that first year that really did hurt him and decrease his political popularity, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of it came from just him and his cabinet not being attuned mm -hmm. to what the federal government was doing. It's worse, we came in in 92, 93, after three Republican terms. So what that means is two Reagan terms and one Bush one term. And what that means is that the last time you had Democrats in any major role in, in the federal government was really a long time ago. It was Jimmy Carter. And frankly, some of them were dead. <laughs> some of them, a lot of them were retired. And so it, it's harder. The longer you've been out, the more difficult the transition is because you, you can't just go to, you know, the last Democratic Secretary of Defense or Secretary of, of, of something or other and say, okay, help us. Your bench is thin, in other your, words. your bench is very thin. And, and I think that that showed in President Clinton's first year. Mm -hmm. Chris, thoughts about, again, how this in crisis that was ongoing as you mm -hmm. came in as you're trying to move forward on health care reform uh, and other uh, aspects of the policy agenda of President Obama. You know, it's an interesting dynamic with the three administrations because I think when folks have, when a president has a governing majority, they think that majority is going to last forever. Um, as we quickly <laughs> learned uh, in 2009 with the Recovery Act, uh, we were able to get health care passed. You know, and, and we, were, we were ready to go, and then we lost the majority in both House and Senate, or lost in the House, certainly. Um, and, and then really for the last six years, we've been relying on executive action and regulations to get our policy agenda done. Uh, we used to always joke um, in White House legislative affairs when, at least in the first term, when staffers would leave, uh, they would print out a nice you know, piece of paper that showed all the bills we had gotten passed uh, during that period of time. I don't know what to give out now because the, <laughs> the list has gotten much, much shorter. Um, but So it was not only the change in policy priorities, it was the change in tactics mm -hmm. uh, that came about uh, because of that 2010 election. Right. We have a few more minutes for, for one last question from me, and I want you all to be thinking of questions that you can ask in the last five or ten minutes of our panel. Um, but I thought we would go down the row, and, and I wanted to present this question to all three of you. Um, what did you learn in the transition and first year of your respective administrations that you wished you had known? Looking back, now you know it, you wished you had <laughs> known going into it. <coughs> 
I don't know, there were a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that the thing that we wished we had known was exactly how complicated pieces of the government were. That from the outside you thought you knew, and then once you got in, there were layers upon layers upon layers. And, you know, here you had, uh, Bill Clinton had been governor of Arkansas for more than a decade. Al Gore had been member of Congress and a member of the Senate for a long time. These were two guys with real experience. And yet there was a, so much learning that went on in that first year. And I think probably making more time to do that would have stood them in better stead later on. More time to learn. More time to learn. You know, I think I was surprised, and I guess I've surprised over the last eight years, how fast this goes. Um, in particular, you have that wonderful window of opportunity in that first year, and that disappears so quickly. I guess the other thing I'd say is that the political pendulum always swings back the other direction. And I think about the policy initiatives that we tried to push in the second term, whether it was gun control or immigration. Uh, we had a supermajority. We could have gotten them done uh, in those first two years, and we decided to sequence other things. Lost those majorities, and we never got the chance to do them again. Right, so prioritization key yeah. at that point. Josh. Um, gosh, Chris, Chris said exactly what I, what I was going to say, which is uh, to have a keener sense of the clock. We, we, we came in with the conventional wisdom, understanding that the most productive period is, is early on. Um, what I, what I, at least I didn't understand well enough going in is, uh, is how small the windows of opportunity for, for productive action are. And therefore, the crucial questions to, to be concerned about, if you know what your priorities are, if, if you know where your policies are, uh, is one, to be aware that they, you, you will be knocked, knocked off balance by some sort of intervening crisis. And number two is, get the sequencing right and, and take the stuff you think is really important and run with it as fast as you can as soon as that window opens. The windows are not only in the, in the first year, um, but, they are, uh, but they are widest in the first year. Uh, and then watch for those windows, pick the right issue, uh, which we did not consistently do uh, later in the administration, and run as fast as you can with them because the windows don't stay open long. I would say words to live by for uh, the incoming administration, and thank you so much. Now let's turn to those of you in the audience, and if you'll wait for a, a mic to come to you. Hi, my name is Richard Skinner, and we've heard a lot of talk about the importance of filling the White House staff early on, and of course everybody pays a lot of attention to the cabinet. But oftentimes, new administrations run into a particularly huge challenge in filling all those sub-cabinet positions, many of which are extremely important in those issue areas. Oftentimes, these are the people who actually can really sink their teeth into the policy detail more so than the cabinet secretaries. I'm wondering what the people on the panel have learned uh, about filling those sub-cabinet positions, which oftentimes can remain vacant for, for a pretty long time. Well, I'll give you my example simply of the Department of Labor. I mean, we have 17,000 employees. We both train people for jobs, and we enforce uh, workplace safety, workplace wage rules. Uh, who your OSHA administrator is, who your wage and hour administrator, are critically important to enforcing those laws. So the point's a very good one. Who your, I mean, I'm biased in the deputy secretary, but who runs these agencies and keeps <laughs> trains running on time and making sure you are doing the internal uh, changes and watching your budget are all important. I will echo Josh's point on the White House staff. I mean, I, I have a lot of things, a lot of thoughts about the Trump transition, but I, I think that they are making the classic mistake of focusing on the cabinet instead of the people who are immediately around the president uh, who can help him get uh, his agenda done. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether that sequencing changes or they start moving faster on that front. They have time. They do have time. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me, Larry Checo. Uh, this running as fast as you can the first year scares me a little bit. Um, my question is, can the first year do irreparable damage to our republic? But do we have enough checks and balances and sanity built into the system to keep us on an even keel somehow? I 
On election night, my son-in-law, who's an army captain, said to me, well, now we have to trust the Constitution. Okay? And I've been quoting that all the time because the Constitution does build in checks and balances, and there are people who are nervous about where a President Trump might go in this first year. Um, but to, to sort of uh, answer that specifically goes to the discussion we've been having, and I think Josh pointed this out. Most candidates for president come into office with policy papers. They come in in a couple of key areas with a deeply thought out policy agenda. I mean, we know that President Bush was, was at what really was steeped in education policy, knew it as governor, came in with a vision. You know, it, it, they knew where to go. So if you come in having campaigned on it, given a lot of speeches on it, et cetera, yeah, you can pretty much do a pretty good job in the first year. Um, the worries, and, and so, and that's generally what tends to happen, you know, is that the, the first year focus is on something that the president cares about, has thought about, there's a lot of guidance on. The problem I think we're facing, and what's making everybody a little bit nervous about the uh, upcoming Trump administration, is that we have an absence of these policy papers. So, we don't quite know what he means, right? We don't know, well, how much money do you want to spend on that? Where are you going to get the money from? Which part of the government are you going to task with implementing that? What's the legislation look like? I mean, there's a whole list of things, right, you have to sort of figure out. And uh, there doesn't seem to be that depth in the Trump um, transition or administration. And that has never, that's brand new. That was never the case. I mean, very few presidents come in knowing everything, but they generally come in with some expertise in some piece of the government and some idea of where they want to know. This, we're in uncharted territory here. Can I, yes, can I John. just throw in something? Because I'm, I'm not as pessimistic, um, well, as you might imagine. Um, <laughs> but um, the, uh, you know, we, uh, I mean, we've spent years here in Washington with everybody bemoaning, oh, the, the gridlock is terrible, Washington never gets anything done, and now all of a sudden people are saying, oh my God, Washington might get something done. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and I, uh, I am a believer in our constitutional system. It is a, it is a, it's a difficult system. It's a system well designed to uh, to frustrate um, uh, frustrate governmental initiative. I, I can't tell you the number of times when I served in the White House. Chris, you probably experienced this too. Elaine, you too. Uh, I had Parliament envy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, because definitely. Thought, you, know, definitely. If, you and Woodrow if, Wilson. <laughs> yeah. If we if we just had a Parliament. You know, we could we could just go do this damn stuff, and you know, get get all those people out of our way. Um, but you can't in our system. And um, I happen to be among those who who thinks that e even though the the Trump team is isn't coming in with fat uh, policy papers, I'm I'm a big believer in tax reform, which there's there's wide consensus in this country we actually need and have not had in 30 full years, not, uh, no significant rewrite of our tax code in 30 years, and it's because the, uh, the, the, the internal tensions that we have built into our constitutional system and the growth of ideological and partisan chasms in, the, in Washington have been too large to bridge. And so on, on areas like tax reform, I am cautiously optimistic that, a, that a, a successful candidate who is not part of the, uh, of the deep ideological uh, divide in this country, he's not part of the deep partisan divide in this country, actually has a chance to help us uh, uh, break gridlock in areas where um, I think the American people will benefit. So I am, uh, 
I'm concerned, <laughs> uh, but I am, I am cautiously optimistic about what, what our system can produce over the next year. Well, thank you. Obviously, this could go on for the entire first year of the next president, this discussion. <laughs> and so I'm going to use my moderator's prerogative to have the last word. Uh, to this gentleman's point, I have several favorite phrases from the Federalist Papers, and they are thusly, wise men may not always be at the helm. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. <laughs> and ambition must be made to counteract ambition. So with that, as the three premises of our Constitution, which has served us well for over two centuries, uh, I, like Josh, have great faith. And as Elaine said, we'll put our faith in the Constitution every time. So thank you so much for your attention, and thank you to our panelists.